Awesome. Well, thank you so much to everyone who's joined us today for our Spring Fling Cook Along event. Um, the ORT is excited to host this workshop um, in association with the UHN Postdoc Association's um, Health and Wellness Committee. Um, so I just want to thank you all for being here. We hope that you enjoy the recipes. Um, we have posted them online, but if you'd like them access to them after, please just email me and I'll send them to you. As well, we'll send out the recording after. Um, if you have any questions at any point in time, please feel free to message me. Or if you have questions for Jeremy, please feel free to put them in the chat or raise your hand. Um, and with that, I will just pass it on to one of our organizers, Leanna Lee. Thank you so much, Amanda. Um, just to re reiterate what you've said, um, on behalf of the UHN Postdoc Association, we welcome you all to our first ever health and wellness event since our inception in September of 2021. So today I have the privilege of introducing our special guest, Chef Jeremy Capone. So Jeremy is a graduate of the School of Kinesiology and Health Science at York University and of the Culinary and Nutrition Man Management Program at George Brown College. He is passionate about teaching essential cooking skills and meal preparation, as well as raising awareness around improving food literacy and food security. Jeremy's current current role is the wellness chef at Elixir, which is the health, wellness, and cancer survivorship center of the Princess Margaret Cancer Center. There he develops and delivers cooking classes, recipes, and interactive videos with Elixir Kitchen Team, with the Elixir Kitchen Team. The Elixir Kitchen program is designed to support people touched by cancer by giving them the skills and information they need to manage their diets. So Jeremy, thank you for supporting the UHN Postdoc Association. We are so excited and grateful to have you here with us today, and we're looking forward to learning from your expertise. So with a very warm welcome, I will pass the reins over to you and let you lead us through this interactive cooking session. Thank you. Thank you, Liana. Thank you, Amanda, uh, for having me today. Uh, I'm really excited to be joining uh, your group again. Um, and we have some pretty fun recipes uh, that we put together. Now, I know we're gonna be doing this demonstration style. Um, it, I think it was part of the invite uh, to join along if you did want to for at least the pasta recipe. So I don't know who is cooking along, uh, but if you are and you have any questions throughout, uh, or even if you're not cooking along, I see an eye from someone. So maybe there, yeah, maybe there are. Uh, one or two cooking along. Uh, that's fantastic. If I move a little quickly, no problem. Um, I'm going to stick to the first recipe um, that we're, we're doing this cook along with, um, and then I might just jump ahead um, to some of the other recipes, but we'll, we'll do it together. That way we don't leave you behind. This is actually the first time we're doing sort of a cook along, so uh, I'm excited. Hopefully it works out okay. Okay, so for the theme for today's recipes, um, actually, Bianca suggested uh, maybe a spring theme, which I love. Uh, I think we can definitely be jumping ahead, or we'd love to jump ahead to some of that spring weather uh, sometime soon. It's not quite, I guess, feels doesn't quite feel like spring yet, but um, at least in the kitchen, we can we can start to, uh, to make it feel a little bit more like spring. So for these recipes, I did want to choose some of those ingredients where you're going to start seeing them first. Like in Ontario, not much is in season yet, obviously, um, but some of the greens uh, that we're going to be using today um, and even just some of the flavor profiles that we're going to be uh, leaning on uh, definitely have more of that spring uh, feel to it. Um, so I think without further ado, I'm going to jump right into it. Um, the first recipe that we are going to be demonstrating is our cavatelli pasta with spring greens. We're going to make a nice, really nice creamy spring greens sauce to go with it. Now we're making pasta from scratch. This is, it might seem intimidating, and you may have done it before. This is a very, very basic uh, recipe. So we're using semolina durum wheat flour. This is something that you would typically see more in southern Italy, um, just because of some of the semolina, that durum wheat grows really well there, and it has no egg. So it's, I think it's very basic. It's flour and water, but it's this durum wheat, this, this wheat that has a little bit more structure to it. I'll actually show you. So 
It has a little bit, um, it's a little hardier. There's a little more protein in it. It almost looks like cornmeal and it has a bit of that coarseness to it. So for those that are cooking along, I'm not sure if you did find the Durham wheat semolina. Um, you can do this with just a regular flour as well. The proportions between your dry ingredients and wet might be a little different, which is okay, it's fine. Um, but for this one here, what we're looking for is um, hydration of about 40%, 40, maybe 50%. Um, and what that means is the proportion of liquid to your dry ingredients, essentially. So unlike an egg-based pasta, which would have a little bit more hydration in it, uh, from obviously the egg yolks, maybe a little bit of olive oil in there, maybe a little water as well, um, this is going to be a little bit drier. So it's going to produce a pasta that um, is a little heartier. Um, it'll have a little more texture, a little more toothsome to it. And it's really great for thicker sauces, um, something that you can even you know cook a little bit in a sauce and it's not going to fall apart. Um, so this, this is actually typically what you would find as a boxed pasta. So your typical boxed pasta uh, will usually be a version of durum wheat and water. Uh, so this dries really well, stores really well, um, just because there are no eggs uh, in it. Um, and so you can make this, you can freeze a batch um, and you can cook it later and it works out great. So for the measurements, I have about a quarter, one and a quarter cup of the semolina flour, which if you're weighing it out is about 160 to 170 grams. Now I don't, love going by weight with pasta. Um, like with baking, obviously, you know, the weights are important. With with pasta, it, it's really the feel. Um, and I know that sounds a little, a little weird, but this is something that you're, you're going to have to sort of adjust as you need. So if you find that as you're making it, it is a little too wet, just add a little bit more flour. And if you're finding that's really, really dry and it's not really coming together, you can just add a little bit more water. Okay, but in that ballpark, you're looking about a one and a quarter cup of the flour, and then I'm going to add about a half a cup of just room temperature water. So at its very simplest, this is all you need to make this pasta, which is fantastic. I am going to add a pinch of salt to it as well, just to season the pasta at this point. And this usually isn't traditional for this type of pasta, but I'm gonna add about a tablespoon of olive oil to it. Um, and I find that it just gives it this really nice sort of glossiness to the pasta dough. Um, so that's sort of my addition. And then you can just use a fork or you can get your fingers in there. And we're just gonna start combining everything together until everything is really well absorbed. So this is probably one of the earliest memories that I have cooking um, with my grandmother. And I was probably maybe four or five. Uh, I can't quite remember what exactly I was responsible for, but I know I was there. And I do remember the massive cutting board that we worked off of, the hours that she would spend just making pasta from scratch. Never really appreciated it then, but the amount of work that went into feeding us sometimes is pretty incredible. But this is this is pretty much a similar recipe, maybe without the olive oil, but very, very simple. And what's nice about this is you can you can make all different types of shapes. Like we're doing actually a variation of a cavatelli. It's not quite a cavatelli, um, but you can do you know, ricchetti, any, any of the smaller uh, shapes are really good. They work really well. This wouldn't be the best pasta dough to do like a ravioli or lasagna. That one I would definitely use an egg yolk based dough. But for what we're doing today, this is perfect. Okay, so pretty much just until it comes together into a dough ball. Um, I know, I just see LC, so uh, LC, oh, maybe Leanne. Leanne, if you were cooking along, this is the, the part that, you know, once it comes together, hopefully it's coming together for you. 
we're going to take that boldo out. And now here's where the kneading comes in. So you can see it's 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 shredded at this point. It's kind of falling apart a little bit. What we want to do is, I mean, like you would approach even like a bread dough. We're going to just knead it into itself. But I want to create some sort of stretching. I want to stretch this out a little bit too and really get those sort of proteins working together. We want to create a really nice bouncy, strong structure for this dough. So I'm going to use the palm of my hands. I'll do it a little slowly here. I'm going to use the palm of my hands to kind of stretch it. So you can see it almost like tearing it a little bit as I'm pulling it along. And then lifting it back up and then putting it back into itself. Okay. So, and you can do this every once in a while. It doesn't have to be like super aggressive, but we're just going to do this for maybe about five minutes or so, just until it comes together. Now, if you were making like an egg based um, pasta dough, then obviously you have eggs, it's going to have, it's going to be a little bit softer. Um, you're, you're not going to need to need it as much and, and you're likely going to be using a pasta machine to roll it out. You can do it by hand as well. Um, but that dough would be really good, like I said, for stuffings. If you're making ravioli, if you're making lasagna, um, there isn't really a better. Like I, we do get asked sometimes, you know, what's better to use, dry pasta or fresh pasta. I usually say it really depends on your application and your sauce. So this is a really good pasta, like I said, for like heartier sauces, uh, even for just like a basic tomato sauce that you're going to be, you know, it's going to be sitting in a liquid like a warmer or hot liquid for a longer amount of time. A, a, a drier pasta dough like this will just hold up a lot better and it won't kind of fall apart and get soggy. Whereas if I was doing like a stuffed pasta, then definitely in like an egg or an egg based dough would be better. All right, so we're getting there and you're gonna find the end it's going to be you're probably finding it it's, it's a little bit of a workout you don't want to put a little bit of muscle into it but you're going to find it's going to be getting a little bit stronger yes yeah i see yes there yeah it's going to be getting a little bit tougher but you should also feel it starting to get a little bit smoother as well which is exactly what we want we want to get it to the point where it's nice and smooth. Now, has anyone else made pasta before? I mean, I don't know if you're, you can even, if you have access to the chat, you can let us know some of your favorite pasta dishes. Have a hand up, fantastic. Some ravioli. And scratch. Yeah, it's fantastic. I, I find it somewhat relaxing. Like this is sort of my, my mindfulness or my meditation, mindful activity. I don't do it all the time, but it is nice to do every once in a while. You can kind of get lost in the kneading part of it. Okay, so a little bit longer, but essentially, what we wanted to do is get it to the point where it's nice and smooth like that. And then if we press it, I don't, know, I don't know if you can see, but that indentation should bounce back. So we know that we've sort of worked the gluten to a point where it has a really nice structure. So it has some bounce back and it's good to go. Now this needs to rest uh, for a few minutes. Um, so, uh, Leanne or whoever is cooking along, if you can wrap it with a little bit of either cling film or you can pop it in like a, a Ziploc bag, 
just to prevent it from drying out. And in like five minutes, 10 minutes, you're fine. You can do this in advance and you can put it in the fridge and make it or use it later in the day or even the next day. It'll actually stay well. It should stay pretty well in the fridge for even a few days. Um, put this at the temp, so I'll put it aside. Keep kneading away if you need to. I'm gonna move on to the sauce really quickly now. So we're gonna make this sort of spring greens sauce. Now, this is, again, like I said, there really isn't much that is growing right now, but you would usually see in first Ontario produce, um, you would have spinach, um, you can have, you know, some arugula, you might have arugula or watercress is uh, another green that would be great to use. This here is um, dandelion. So dandelion, another one, maybe not super common for everyone. Um, you are seeing it more and more in grocery stores now, which is great. Um, but dandelion, and yes, it's the same dandelion as the sort of yellow weed that you probably are familiar with. Um, this is obviously not quite picked, you know, from people's lawns, although I know that people do pick their own dandelions and uh, cook with them. I probably wouldn't suggest it, uh, especially if you have, especially in the front lawn. I wouldn't use that dandelion. Uh, but this one here from a grocery store and the leaves are slightly, slightly bitter, um, but it has this really, really nice uh, flavor to it. Now, if you don't, if you're not really fond of the bitterness from greens, you can blanch them, which is what we're gonna do with, all, with everything for the sauce. And you can blanch them for a little bit uh, and then drain that water and the, the greens will become a lot less bitter. Amanda saying, yeah, your grandmother used to pick dandelions from the side of the road. Yeah, so you will probably still, still see that. Um, around springtime, uh, you may see um, uh, people picking something from, uh, I used to remember going to York University and uh, on the side of the road there, you'd be people picking something from the ground. It was dandelions. Uh, so yeah, that is pretty common. Uh, yeah, you have chard and kale, stems removed, beautiful. Uh, yes, absolutely. Yeah, so any greens would work in this. Uh, with kale, yeah, remove the stems. Chard, you can, um, if they're really thick stems, then yeah, maybe use them for something else because we're just going to give this a quick blanch. But any of the tender stems or smaller stems, you can just leave in. That'll be fine. Uh, and it doesn't have to be fresh. Like, you know, I was able to get this um, at the grocery store. They had it fresh. They had the spinach. They had the dandelion. Even if you have frozen, it works really, really well. Um, it's something that actually we talk about quite a bit in our classes. You know, we love promoting frozen fruits and vegetables, uh, just as nutritious as fresh, but they're just super accessible um, and uh, longer shelf life and and uh, a lot less expensive as well. So if, if you have frozen, frozen will also work. Uh, so to get this going, I'm just going to start adding them to like. Pot of water. So I have just a pot of water here. Bring it up to a boil. I might just put a, just a small pinch of salt. I don't need too much here. I'm gonna go with a good. This is a lot, but a good handful of each. Throw a little bit of a dandelion. I'll just throw. Nice handful of spinach, maybe a couple handfuls of spinach in there. Beautiful, yeah, so any greens will work in this. Uh, tongs, okay. And if you just wanna soften these up a little bit. Now, if you do have any fresh herbs that you wanna add, you can definitely add those as well. So I don't think I added them on the recipe list, uh, but if you have like basil, and I did have some basil 
in the fridge. So I'm going to throw just a little handful. You don't have to, but if you like basil, I'm going to just toss that in. It's only going to spend a couple of minutes or so. And then for peas, peas are another great spring ingredient. Um, definitely, in, you know, one of the best times to enjoy them when you first start seeing them, maybe in like May, for lucky April, but probably May. You start to see those fresh peas from Ontario. Those would be fantastic in here. Um, obviously, we haven't seen them yet, so I'm going to be adding just frozen peas, which, again, are just as great. What's nice about the peas, this is going to add nice body to the recipe. So it's going to thicken it up a little bit. Now I'm going to just leave those in there maybe for a minute or so, just to soften the peas a little bit. I'm going to throw them in our blender. So I've got my blender here. We're going to add the greens in a second. I'm going to add some nuts to this. Um, so it, it's almost like we're making a pesto. It's almost like a cross between a thinner, a thinner pesto, it's like a smooth, thin pesto. Um, but this is a nice, this is a cool little technique that I actually picked up from my aunt. Um, and she used to make like a, you know, a, you know, she had to feed, you know, probably all of us, my cousins and us, uh, pretty quickly. She would make a quick rosé sauce uh, with just some canned tomatoes, like canned whole tomatoes, and a handful of almonds. Um, and then you throw them in the blender, add maybe a little bit of the pasta water, and then blend it up. And you have this like really, really quick, easy um, rosé sauce. Um, and it's, it was that addition of the nuts in it that gave it that sort of creaminess, it gave it that body, gave it that, you know, thickened it up a little bit. And I think it works really, really well with, with this recipe uh, also. So you can use almonds uh, or cashews. I have some cashews here, so I'm gonna throw about, um, obviously I'm just doing this by hand, I'm not measuring anything. So I'm looking at my recipe for reference, about half a cup. Yeah, so about half a cup, give or take. This is, again, this is, this is a recipe you can kind of, do it by hand. These greens are ready. I'm going to throw those in here. And the peas as well, which be a little difficult. So I'm going to have to get a sip of that. Jeremy, we have a question about whether the cashews you're using should be raw. Mm, good question. So they can be raw or roasted. Um, I find that just to make sure that they're unsalted. I find that using salted nuts is just going to be, uh, it's going to be adding a little too much salt to it and kind of takes that control away. But uh, they could be raw or roasted. The raw, I find if you're, if you need them really soft, like if you're soaking them to, to incorporate into, you know, a sauce or um, butter, if you're making a peanut butter, like a cashew butter, the raw does soak a little bit better than the roasted, but for something like this, you can use uh, either or. Good, good question. All right, so the greens are in there. Realize I used my small sieve for one of our other recipes. So I'm gonna go on with the big one, try to catch them all. So we have our greens, we have our peas, we have our cashews in there. And now for some acidity, so I'm gonna add a bit of lemon juice and actually you can use the lemon zest as well just to give it another little punch citrus again this is going to have for me that sort of spring vibe to it just just from that citrus and funny enough the 
all citrus, like lemons, oranges, limes. The season is actually throughout the winter. So the best, the juiciest citrus fruit you're gonna find usually between December and March, uh, using to end of March. So those are your best. You're still finding some really, really good quality citrus right now, but um, that's sort of the season for it. But still, when I think of citrus, when I think of like orange and lime, it's like think more of the summertime and springtime. All right, so a little bit of the zest, a good amount of juice in there. If you want some garlic, you can definitely throw some garlic in there for a nice little punch. Um, I'm going to also throw in a little bit of cheese. So you can use parm or uh, a pecorino cheese. So pecorino cheese is like a sharper cheese. It's made with uh, sheep's milk. Um, so you can use either. You don't need too much. It does have a really nice punch of flavor to it, which is great. Go with half a cup ish here. That's pretty much it. I'm gonna set this aside. I don't wanna blend it just yet. Um, we're gonna shape the pasta and then we're gonna blend this because I'm actually gonna use a little bit of that pasta water in here as well. Um, that starchy water is gonna uh, give you a really, really nice consistency to the sauce. So we'll put that to the side. How are we doing so far? Everyone following along okay? Leanne, yeah, you still with me? Yes, fantastic. All right. So now we're going to be ready to roll. This is a pasta dough I made a little bit earlier. You prepped in advance. Fantastic. Okay, great. So this is a pasta dough I made a little bit earlier. Um, this is the one that was resting for about 10 minutes or so. I want to show you the difference. The longer it relaxes, it's going to be a little bit firmer, but it's also not going to have as much bounce back. So I'm going to show you the difference. Either you can do either or. They're just going to react a little differently. As long as you let it rest for at least ten minutes, you should be okay. Okay, so this is the one that I had resting for probably maybe a couple hours in the fridge. Okay, so just cut off a little piece about that size, and a little breadstick, okay? And then try not to get any shadow from the lights here. Then we're just gonna sort of roll it out, okay? We're gonna create almost like a snake. So this is, again, this is, yes, it looks like biscotti. So it's like biscotti, yeah, Vienna. Yeah, it does look like biscotti. And now we're gonna roll it out. Diameter of about a, like a standard pencil, maybe a little bit thicker. Again, this is, it's, it's like playing with Play-Doh all over again. Well, Wendy, no worries. I'm just rolling out the pasta. All right, so we're gonna get to this point. Now, you can see as I'm rolling it out, it's pulling back a little bit, but there isn't a ton of bounce back. It's Doing a pretty good job of holding its shape. Out there for a second. I want to take the fresher dough that I made. Let's see. Now, like I said, you can you can do either. As long as it has ten minutes to rest, you should be fine. just might find that there's a little more elasticity to the fresher dough, only because it, it needs that time to sort of relax. So I don't know if you can see on the screen, but as I'm rolling it out, the ends are, are pulling back in a little bit. It's not too bad because it, we gave it a little bit of time. 
but it just wanted to show you how you know, even just relaxing the difference of like an hour, what it does to the dough. It kind of comes back in, it's not too bad. Though. All right, so we have our strands and we used, oh, probably not even a quarter of that dough recipe. So you can see how much it would make. And then with our strands, we wanna cut off, and again, this doesn't have to be perfect. Even if they're slightly different sizes, that's absolutely fine. Um, but we wanna cut off pieces that are about, about the size of like a chiclet, a little chiclet gum. And you, know, you can try to keep them about the same size the best you can. It doesn't have to be perfect. We'll do a bunch here. So we're creating these like little pillows. And this is really fun if you have helpers where you wanna fun like kind of dinner party activity. I don't know how many people would agree to do some of the labor at a dinner party, but I think it might be kind of fun. All right, so now we have all these little pillows of dough ready to be shaped. I'm gonna see if I can move them a little bit closer. See it okay? Yes, we can see it. Okay, so oh, there we go. So now we have all these little little pieces of dough that we can shape. So you can take this in any direction. Traditionally, from what I remember my grandmother and doing is just using our hands. And that's probably how you'll see most people do it um, that are still making pasta from scratch. And you would just sort of take your thumb and press it into the pasta gently and then drag it, giving it a, a little bit of force, actually quite a bit of force. And as you drag into the cutting board or onto your surface, it should follow along and then create this little sort of concave. So this would be sort of your traditional shape for a cavatelli. Now cavatelli in Italian translates to like little hollows or like little, I think that little hollows is probably like the exact definition, but like little indents. Um, and that's the idea is you're gonna create these little hollows, little indents uh, which are amazing at sort of capturing the sauce that you added to, to kind of hold it really well. So I did two there. You can see why this might be a little laborious. Um, probably not something you can do all the time, but it is it is kind of fun to do once in a while, right? Oh, there's a quick question. Is relaxing the fridge or counter better? Uh, great question. So if you're only going to be relaxing your dough for like 20 minutes, 30 minutes uh, max, um, like for this, this dough, like even 10 minutes is fine, but if you're going to go max 20 minutes, 30 minutes on the countertop is okay. If you're going to go over, over that, like up to an hour or even overnight, then do it in the fridge and you better relax the fridge. Okay. Uh, so there we go. So that's how you, you can kind of do it by hand. Okay. You can also do it with, um, different utensils. So I like this technique too, with a butter knife. This is just a little mini spatula, but you can use a, a butter knife and do almost the same technique, but I'm gonna start pulling it towards me now. So I'm gonna grab one of the pieces and I press down and then start dragging it, pulling it towards me. And you can get that sort of similar shape, I'm drag it, pull it towards me. And again, you can get that similar shape. If you want to get fun with it and do something a little different, uh, you can use, so they have these little groove boards 
they call them our yacht keyboards. You can find these. I, actually, I bought mine on Amazon. I think it was like eight bucks. Uh, but even like kitchen kitchen surplus stores would have them as well. Um, and what's cool about these is what you can do is get that groove shape on to give it even more concave spaces for it to capture sauce. So we're gonna, again, use one of those little pieces and I'm gonna press into the board, dragging down and just let it fall off. And so you get that concave on one side, but on the other side, you get those really cool grooves as well. Well, this is, you know, you can kind of mix it up. If you don't have one of those, you can also use a fork, which is really simple. It has that same groove shape. So we'll take one of those little pieces and we'll press it. Oh, let's slip a little bit. Press it into the fork. Drag it down. So you get that groove and a little concave in there. That's pretty much it. So you can spend probably up to an hour just doing a few servings of this. But as you get sort of comfortable with it, it'll come a lot easier. You can probably put a couple of servings together, like 10 minutes, 15 minutes. So Leanne, hopefully you're doing okay there with the shaping. I'm curious to know what shapes you're using. So again, you can use your finger, like I said, you can use like a butter knife tool or a fork to create some of those grooves. Now at that point there, what I like to do is just get a, get a little baking tray and then just add it to the tray. And you can cook them fresh as is like this. But these also dry really, really well. So it's working. Fantastic. Yes. Um, so you can dry these out. Um, you know, you can just put like a clean dish towel over top um, and you can let them dry out. If I am making a bunch to save or if I have leftover, what I actually like to do is I'll throw them in a, in a Ziploc bag and pop them in the freezer. Um, they freeze exceptionally well. Um, and then right from the freezer, you can throw them right to your boiling pot of water. Uh, to make it super super easy. So while you're still working away, Leanne, keep going until I guess you have enough of a portion that you'd like to put together. I'm gonna throw this mount into the same same boiling water that we use for the greens. Throw the pasta in. Maybe like a bit of a little stir, just a little stick. Now this doesn't take long. Um, probably I would start checking at around the four minutes mark. Um, it's about, it'll take about probably three to four minutes if they're super fresh like this. If they're dry, they might take a little bit longer. Um, but that's that's sort of when you want to just test it, test it at try it at that four minute five minute mark, um, and it should. Um, it should be soft, but it should have some what we call al dente. I'm sure you've heard that that phrase before. So it should have some bite uh, to it, uh, which is great. So three, four minutes, that'll be ready. Now we can finish the sauce at this point. Blender. And obviously you can use a box sauce with this uh, recipe as well. You don't have to make it from scratch. I love, I love it just for the greens. Like I'll make it, I'll make the sauce just like this greens sauce on its own and then just throw it in the box pasta sometimes. And uh, so you're saying you learn from our steaks when uh, you're a naive undergrad. Don't thaw the frozen cabbage tell Yes, yeah, don't, yeah, that's a great, uh, tip, yeah, don't, no need to thaw them before, um, especially fresh, like egg-based pasta, egg-based noodles, uh, they will make a mess if you thaw them, just right from the freezer, right into your boiling water, absolutely. All right, so for our green sauce, uh, we're gonna go a little higher here. So 
Let's see what's going on. So again, we have the blanched greens. We have those peas, parm, we have the lemon. I'm gonna add just a little bit this pasta liquid as well. Start off with about a ladle, and then if I need more, I can add more. A little bit of olive oil, maybe about a couple tablespoons ish of olive oil in there. And then you can season a little salt and pepper. I already put some salted, uh, the pasta water, the cooking water was salted with the greens. So I'm going to leave it as is and then adjust afterwards if I need to. I'm gonna actually put myself on mute so I don't blow your ears off with this blender. So just pureed it until it was creamy. I hope you appreciated my fancy camera work there. Try to get right into the blender. Don't think it worked out too well, but we're gonna get it to pretty much that point, okay? So it's almost like a green smoothie. Maybe that's probably the best consistency. So it has that pesto quality to it, but it's much, much thinner. And the pesto and obviously a lot smoother as well. Um, this is, it's really good. Like you can see that from the color, just super, super green, really vibrant. It's gonna have that, definitely it's gonna have that spring feel to it with all those greens and the lemon. And a little bit of that, uh, that parm for that punch of umami in it. The pasta is probably done as well. So I'm gonna, Drain that. Perfect. Yeah, so it should be soft, but it should still have some bounce to it. Ian, how you doing? So there's the pasta. Some of those peas that I didn't scoop out are in there too, which is okay. That back in the pot. We'll add right in some of that sauce. We don't need that much like for just a little over a serving. But that sauce coats it so well. And that color is, again, I think that's the best part about it. It's just so vibrant. And Definitely has, like I said, definitely has a like, sort of pesto vibe to it, but it's lots of sauce here. And those those concave sort of canals in that cavatelli pasta are 
that would really help to kind of grab that extra box there. All right, and then finish it with just a little bit of harm. I think that's this is usually like the money shot anytime you see like a food network show. It's like finish it with another mountain of cheese on top. You can put as much as you want. Again, the parm is really good. If you've never tried um, like a sharp sheep's milk cheese, like, like a pecorino, it is really, really, um, really, really nice. A really nice comparison or substitute for parm. Um, but the sheep's milk, if you do like, like a sheep's milk, a like goat cheese, that tartness, that sharpness actually plays really well with uh, the greens and the lemon in this. Actually, more I'll put a little lemon zest on the top too. Why not? There we go. So that is our first recipe, the cavatelli pasta with spring greens. I realized that it took us some time. It's 4.48. We're gonna zoom through the next two. Uh, how's everyone doing? Leanne, hopefully you're following, still following along. Easy, I'm telling you it is easy. It is, it is very, very easy. Shaping more, no problem. Take your time. I'm, I'm gonna go through the next two demo, demos. They're coming together, fantastic, that's exciting. All right, so that's the first recipe. Hopefully you give that one a shot. Now we're going to move on to our next, try to straighten up this camera. So as you can see, obviously we're still virtual with all of our classes that we're doing. We're, we're still doing virtual classes for all our patient programming. Um, that uh, Yana mentioned. Um, for those that aren't aware of our program, so we are part of uh, Princess Margaret's Cancer Center. Uh, we're part of the Cancer Rehabilitation and Survivorship Program. Not too sure how many people are aware of our program, but uh, it's a wonderful multidisciplinary team. Um, and the cooking and nutrition uh, uh, is myself and our dietitian. So Daniela Fiorini, she's our dietitian. We co-host a uh, bunch of classes. So we do uh, mostly uh, side effect specific um, classes. And we have one on fatigue, cancer related fatigue. We do one with our care group as well, which is a program that patients are referred to. And it's sort of an eight week program where they see uh, different healthcare uh, professionals. Um, and then we have our monthly cooking class on our YouTube channel, which is open to anyone. So if you were interested in watching more recipe, more cooking videos, we do a one hour on the third Thursday of every month at 12 o'clock uh, on our YouTube channel. And we live stream that. And there's always three new recipes, uh, seasonal, healthy, uh, pretty much this style. And Leanne, yes, yeah, you can absolutely freeze um, whatever you don't use. You can freeze the dough too. Yes, you can freeze the dough, the pasta dough, like even in its whole form, and then you just defrost it when you're ready to, to roll them again. You can definitely do that. Okay, so for this recipe, we're gonna be making um, cheese from scratch. I don't know if anyone's made cheese before, but we're making we call it the cheese from scratch. Again, this is one of those things where I my mind kind of goes to when we're we're thinking about spring is cheese making. Um, you know, again, not not sure why, but I think like the prime cheese making months are probably from late spring until like autumn. Um, and um, making we call it the cheese from scratch. It's super super easy. Uh, so if you've never tried it before, I think this is a nice, again, a nice little trick. You can buy it, it's a lot easier just you know, to buy it, but if you did want to try making it from scratch, uh, all you need is a couple ingredients. So we're using whole milk. Sorry, I'm looking at the computer, I realized the camera's here. We're using whole milk, 
um, three, so I'd say 3.8 percent here. And we are going to um, sort of co coagulate the proteins in there with an acid. Um, so you can use white vinegar or you can use lemon. Now, ricotta cheese is traditionally made uh, using the byproduct, that, that whey byproduct of uh, cheese making, right? So you have that whey that comes off and then they will coagulate that mixture. Um, any extra proteins that remain um, sort of come together and you get this nice, like almost like farmer's cheese or like the soft cheese. Um, but you can do it at home just by using um, milk. And we're using, like I said, uh, 3.8, so full fat milk. You can do this with like a cream as well to get an even creamier, richer cheese. It would absolutely work. You can also do this with lactose free. So I know that um, I was watching some program, they were saying that you couldn't do it. You can absolutely do it with lactose free milk because it's the proteins that you're looking for. It's not really the lactose that is necessary in this process. So if you wanted a lactose free version, if you had a lactose intolerance, you can definitely do it with uh, lactose free. Just try to find, use again, the most important thing is a higher fat um, because you're going to get more of that cheese, that we call the cheese byproduct if you use a higher fat uh, milk. Okay. Um, so what we're essentially doing is warming this up until it starts to simmer. So you're looking at about 75 to 85 degrees Celsius. And you can whisk it every once in a while. And you can either do it until it just starts to simmer, or if you have a food thermometer, that's sort of the easiest way to gauge. Now, this is sort of my fancy way, this is my fancy contraption, because I don't want it to touch the bottom of the pot, because it's going to get an incorrect reading. I want, to, I want it to balance somewhere in the middle there. So we have an elastic here, get real fancy. And we're just going to balance it just like that. So I can kind of gauge, but you do want to whisk it every once in a while because you don't want it to burn the bottom. So that's probably the most challenging part of it is getting it to that point uh, where we're going to add our acid. And then once it's at that between 75 and 85 degrees Celsius, we're going to go ahead and add some lemon juice to create that sort of coagulation. Okay. While that is happening, I'm gonna make a little, kind of like a little salsa or a little gremolata to go with it. So we're gonna make this really nice crostini. So we're gonna use, again, off of that sort of spring theme, we're gonna be using some herbs, some fresh herbs here. Um, you can use parsley, basil, cilantro, um, whatever you like and just sort of finely chop that up. You can throw some mint in there as well. And what, so this is called a, a gremolata. We're making sort of a variation of it, which is essentially, it's like a dry pesto. Okay, so you would usually see this added to maybe the top of meats, like slow cooked meats, or uh, you can even throw it on top of pasta or something like that. But it's the idea is that you have this like really intense sort of very fresh punch of flavor. The idea again is that there's no, it's just the dried herbs and maybe some grated garlic and some lemon zest. That's usually your classic. Let me chop that up. Now, instead of lemon zest, I actually wanted to change it up and try something a little different with this. And so I'm going to be using uh, preserved lemons uh, or pickled lemons. I don't know if anyone's seen this before, um, but it is used in, I mean, you see this in a lot of like North African cuisine. You'll see it in some Middle, East, Middle Eastern cuisine as well. And essentially these small pickled lemons. Um, and they have this really incredible fragrance to them. You, you would see them in tagine. So if you have like slow cooked meat dishes in tagines, you would usually see like a lemon, one of these pickled lemons in there. And it has this incredible 
lemon fragrance to it. Um, but this brininess that's very similar to, it's very similar to almost like, like capers or olives. So I'll take one of these out here. And you can find these in definitely in like Middle Eastern grocery stores. I was at Adonis and that's where I picked it up. But some regular grocery stores will probably have them as well. If you don't want to use these or if you can't find them, then just use lemon zest. That's traditionally how it is made, with lemon zest. All right, so the one thing that you do want to use do if you're using these is just rinse them off the barrel bit on the salty side. And what I'm going to do is just quarter them and take out the seeds and a little bit of that flesh on the inside because that will be really, really salty. What I want to use is just the rind on it. And again, the flavor of these, it's really hard to replicate. Like it just has this amazing lemony, perfumey, brininess to it. Just an incredible punch of flavor. And we're just going to slice them up and just cross cut that. So I want, I want these to be pretty small. I want them to be nice and fine, almost like your herbs. So we'll just roughly chop that up over that so that's nice and fine. And one lemon goes a long way. It has really, really intense flavor. So that'll probably be more than enough. And then we're gonna add a little bit of garlic to that. So we'll grate some garlic on top. Now you can mince the garlic by hand, but I find these little rasps, these microplane graters work exceptionally well for that. Uh, you can add some onion too if you want. And this is pretty much it. So it would be this sort of dry dressing. Now I'm gonna add a little bit of olive oil to it, which is not super traditional, but for this topping, I want to have, I want to have it flow. So I'll just add a touch while we go to that. And this is incredible. Like if you if you have barbecue, um, even like grilled vegetables, and you top it with a little bit of this little herb and even lemons, this is fine. But that that preserved lemon just gives it this incredible freshness and brightness especially with rich meats, rich cuts. This works really, really well. Okay, kind of lost track of the note, but that's okay. Kind of racing against the time here. I know it's five o'clock. Uh, Leanna, I might be going like five minutes over. Is that okay, five, 10 minutes? That's definitely totally okay with us. I mean, if anybody has to jump off, of course you're more than welcome to, but we're fine to stay on for another five to 10 minutes. Okay, wonderful. Uh, okay, so the milk has hit its temp. Simmering. At this point, we're going to add about two tablespoons of either lemon juice or white vinegar. Now, because I'm using it in a dish with lemon, I find that lemon works really well with it. Um, if you want it to be super neutral, then use vinegar because it's obviously not going to impart any flavor. And once you add that acid, just start to gently stir it through. So you start to see it coagulate and you'll start to see it come together like that. I don't know if it's hard to see those little curds forming. Once you start to see those curds forming, take it off the heat and just let it sit for five minutes, okay? Now when that starts to, when it sits, you're gonna to start to see more of those curds form. And then you can just drain it out. So it took like five minutes or so, drain that out with your cheesecloth uh, or a fine mesh like strainer. And I 
done on an advance here to save some time. And so pretty much that mixture goes right through a sieve. And I had cheesecloth here. You can, yeah, it, it will work in a fine, this is a fine mesh sieve that will also work. Um, but what you're left with is this incredibly creamy cotta cheese. Uh, and super crumbly, super flavorful. And you can season it as well. If you want to add a little bit of salt, you can definitely add some salt to that as well. Now, if you like it super creamy, just let it drain for like five minutes and then use it. If you like it a little bit firmer, then you can put it in the fridge like I did here and let it go even up to an hour, okay? And you can even put some weight on it. So if you cover that up, put like a little mason jar on it and that'll press out more of that water there. Um, then you'll get like a firmer cheese. Uh, and again, what's nice about this is you can kind of customize it. This is a very neutral flavor. You'll have a little bit of that lemon, but you can throw in some like chili flakes or some fennel seed if you want, um, you know, to spike it up a little bit. You can put some oregano in there. Um, so yeah, really, really easy to make. Um, and actually uh, one of my students, uh, culinary students, uh, sent me a recipe for a tofu version. Uh, which is awesome as well. Um, so maybe I can post that somewhere, maybe Amanda or Liliana, I can send that to you if someone did want a plant-based version of that. All right, so there's our cheese. Now this byproduct, this extra whey here, um, don't throw this out. This is exceptional in baked goods. Um, you can throw this in, you know, if you're making muffins or bread or if you're making pizza dough, um, this is really, really good. I know people that actually throw it in their smoothies uh, as well. Um, so you can definitely use this. If you're not going to use it within a couple days, though, just freeze it. Just like that. Okay. okay. It's a go here. Now, this is really nice. You can crumble this on a salad. Um, maybe even some like grilled peaches, grilled fruits would be really nice. Or we're gonna make some crostinis here. So this is just some grilled bread. Some cheese, just spread it on top. And it is, this is like really, really tasty. And, and you've made it yourself, which is great. So a liter, you can see a liter will yield about this is almost a cup of ricotta cheese, which is great. And then on top of this, this again, this would be really good on top of pizza. So I just realized we're going pretty carbon heavy this these recipes, but that's okay. And then we'll take some of that really, really nice fragrant preserved lemon from that on top. That is our Christini with our preserved lemon grimolata on there. Correct. Awesome. This is the drawback about the virtual part. I'll, I'll be eating these all myself, unfortunately. So I have to make it at home. Share, share the results with us. Okay, really quickly to end it off, I'm gonna do a, a dessert. Uh, this, nothing traditional about this. This is kind of an experiment. But again, when I think of spring, I think of carrots. And so I want to make a sorbet with carrots and mango. And we'll put a couple other flavors in there. Um, and we're gonna make it super easy with the food processor. So you can definitely do this if you have a wide base blender as well. Um, but if you have a food processor, find it works fantastic for 
these types of like quick ice creams or frozen yogurts. So I'm gonna get a carrot and grate about half a cup ish in here. This might be the weird part, like carrot in a dessert. But you think of like carrot muffins or carrot cake, and it works. I think what's nice about the carrot with something sweet like mango is that it still has the sweetness to hold up to it, but you get a little bit of that earthiness as well, which is really nice. All right, so we're going to grate up the carrot in there. I'm going to throw a little bit of ginger in there too, some fresh ginger. Give that a tablespoon. The carrot and ginger work really well together. All right. And I'm going to go in with our frozen mango. Like sorbet or ice cream like this. You just need one frozen ingredient. As long as there's one frozen element. It'll be fine. So you can swap out mango and you can do this with frozen cherries or frozen peaches. Right, so about two cups. And then for our liquid, we're gonna throw some orange. I'm gonna squeeze, I'm gonna squeeze the whole orange in there. And this is gonna give it, obviously it's own little flavor, it's own little bit of sweetness, but the acid in this is really important. So when we're working with anything that's frozen, and this, this actually applies to frozen vegetables as well. The freezing process does dull the flavor a little bit. If you add something acidic to it, um, either citrus, so lemon, lime, orange, or even a vinegar base. Like I wouldn't put a vinegar in here, but if you're doing like a frozen broccoli or something, you add a little bit of vinegar. That acidity is gonna help to enhance the flavor of that frozen product. It's gonna brighten it up a little bit. It's gonna actually, so if you're using like frozen blueberries, for example, uh, this is pretty common, you're making a smoothie, it might not taste like the best blueberries. Um, that's because they're frozen. So if you add a little bit of lemon, even a couple of drops of lemon juice in there, that acid is going to help enhance the blueberry flavor. And it's gonna make them taste way better. Um, if you want some extra sweetness, you can add some honey to this. I'm actually, I'm not gonna add it because it's gonna be pretty flavorful on its own. And we're gonna throw the lid on. Now I'm gonna put some water on the side and add it if I need it. The key here to make a really nice consistency is not to jump the gun on adding liquid uh, because you want this to be pretty solid, okay? So I'm gonna just mute myself again real quick.
All right, so we're, we're almost there. You can see how it's starting to come together. And we're starting to get that really nice sort of ice cream consistency. I just want to scrape down the sides and just do it a couple more times. Does anyone have any questions, by the way? This is almost done. I know I'm taking it a little past five, but if you have any questions, please happy to answer. Right, and there we go. So it takes maybe a couple minutes, a little patience, and just kind of scraping down as you go. You get this really, really nice sorbet consistency there. Now, if it's on the thinner side, you can absolutely just pop this into the freezer and let it firm up a little bit. Uh, but this is really nice like if you want a quick little dessert or if you, you know, you have a good, you know, a dinner party or something and you need something pretty quick and easy uh, and this is also super 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 refreshing so there it is it's got some carrots in it might be a little weird but it tastes pretty good and that is the last recipe so thank you again so much for joining uh liana and amanda thank you so much for having me. Uh, hopefully for those that uh, did cook along, it did work out and uh, enjoy as well. And if you have any other questions or if you did want to see more content from our cooking program, you can check out elixirkitchen.ca. I think I saw the enemy maybe or, or Amanda posted the link in the chat. But uh, yes, thanks for having me. Have a wonderful weekend. And hopefully we can do this again soon. Yes. Thank you so much.